Axis of Trust podcast. The Edifice of Trust podcast is a thoughtful discussion of today's current events from the perspective of America's founding principles. Hello. I call today's episode Tension Prisoners. You'll soon find out why. The capture of government and its power to tax by private interests can only occur with the cooperation, might I say connivance, of politicians and or bureaucrats. But we must also be aware that it is sometimes difficult to determine what is the proper use of the government's power. The public interest is, in reality, an agglomeration of private interests. When the private interests of a large number of people are well served by a particular policy or project, then it can be considered in the public interest. For example, the condemnation of privately held land held by a few private persons in order to develop a commuter rail line that will serve many thousands of commuters can be considered in the public interest. But helping a minority of private persons at the expense of a majority can also be in the public interest, as could be argued in the case of affirmative action, in order to establish justice or to correct historic wrongs. Using the power of eminent domain to confiscate the property of private persons is a serious matter, and such power must be wielded with great restraint, and the same can be asserted for the use of affirmative action. The point here is that it is not always easy to determine when a policy crosses the line from good policy in the public interest to the abuse of the public interest in, in favor of private or special interests. Our government workers deserve compensation and benefits similar to those in the private sector. It is not only a matter of justice and equity, but it is also a matter of having access to the best available talent pool of potential workers. Many states allow public employees to organize and bargain collectively in order to assure these benefits. When I was growing up, which many people assert is still a work in progress, public employment was considered more secure but not as well compensated as private sector employment. So the low wages of public employees were offset by civil service law that provided job security and limited the arbitrary firing of such employees at, as could be caused by political patronage and also by relatively generous retirement packages. But with the advent of public employee unions, their salary compensation has increased to equal or exceed that of the private sector while still retaining job security and pension benefits far beyond what is available in the private sector. Further, a Brookings Institute study revealed that once unionized, the public employee's contribution to retirement benefits declined, while that of the public employer increased about three times. Public employees are also more likely to have costly defined benefit plans than private sector workers who have defined contribution plans such as 401ks. The final nail in the public employee pension benefits coffin is the fact that public employees can retire after 25 years service and immediately collect benefits even if they get another public sector or private sector job. This is known as double dipping. So much for means testing or waiting in, until retirement age like most people. One can make a case that certain classes of public employees, such as first responders, need generous benefits due to the hazardous nature of their work. But there is a difference between generous and ludicrous. It is true that dangerous fire and police functions cannot be performed by some people as they get older. But retiring after 25 years service in one's late 40s or early 50s is more than generous. There are light-duty jobs in police and fire departments that can be easily performed by older workers. So, acknowledging that public employees deserve competitive compensation and retirement benefits, how do some of these programs, actually many of them, slip into an unethical and immoral capture of the government? Public worker salaries are funded by taxes collected in the current year. If public worker salary increases caused a substantial tax increase, 
The resulting backlash by taxpaying voters could be dangerous to the political health of elected officials responsible for the increase in taxes. But retirement benefits are paid out in the future, so politicians have been buying labor peace with gold-plated pension benefits for many years. And since fully funding these future benefits would cause the same political health impact as high current salaries, these pension fund payments have been seriously underfunded for decades. Right now, the estimate of the underfunding for the pensions of state and local government workers range from two to four trillion, with a T, dollars. In some cities and states, the underfunding problems have become acute. Payments to current retirees are rising rapidly, and local governments are increasing taxes to meet these payments. Worse yet, these local governments, such as Richmond and several other California cities, are cutting back on the services they deliver to their citizens because they don't have enough money left after their pension payments. Others have gone bankrupt. So we have come back to the problem where private interests have captured government against the public interest, and we are faced with a moral and ethical problem that we must resolve. Citizens living in these cities and states are paying taxes for services rendered years or even decades ago to citizens who may have died or moved to another state, probably one with a lower tax rate. Obligated pension funding can be as much as 40% of some cities' annual budgets. Politicians, in collusion with public employee unions, have worked against the public interest, and the citizens are crying for redress. Public companies are required to disclose their estimated underfunded pension obligations, and their share price may suffer if they have a large unfunded position. But state and local governments, as well as the federal government, operate on a cash basis, so unfunded future obligations are swept under the rug. Some people may say a deal is a deal and we have to honor these pension deals. Some are even protected by state constitutions. But a fraudulent deal is not a deal but a crime. Of course, the public employees did not knowingly commit these crimes or attempted to defraud current citizens, so, so they need to be protected even if the terms of their pensions need to be modified. State and local governments are being held captive by public employee unions, but it is the tax-paying citizens who are the real prisoners. There are a number of remedies for this frightful situation. The public employee unions will resist any change to the benefits their members are due to receive, but the ethical case is clear. The private interest of union members must be subordinated to the public interest. For starters, defined benefit plans need to be replaced by defined contribution plans. Pensions should not be paid out until retirement age, and double dipping should not be allowed. Retirement plans must be self-sustainable so that citizens are not forced to pay for the errors and omissions of past public officials or suffer a cutback in the services that they are paying for. Thank you. Forget my most recent publication, 2017, A Trumpian Year in Review, is now available at various book outlets, including Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, in either paperback or ebook format, also available at Apple as an iBook. It's joined by my other books, Principal Policy, A Conversation About America, Edifice of Trust Toward a Principled Social Policy, and also my novel, Tawan Tinsuyu, a novel about nuclear terror. And don't forget my fascinating and exciting summation of the principles of taxation. For more information and links to the book outlets, please check out my website, www.edificeoftrust.com. Thanks. I don't mean to pick on public employees. Many groups try to capture government in order to benefit their own special interests. But public employees are insiders. 
They have a special ability to influence how government works. Most citizens deal with government only when they have to, and many try to keep as far away from government as possible. We don't always know the ins and outs of how government works, but the public employees live and breathe the government every day. They know how to get things done, and they also know how to not get things done. These are positions of trust because many people feel powerless to confront government. Public employees have a unique ability to abuse their positions. Most don't abuse their positions. They know that they are there to serve the public and do so daily. But the union's job is not to serve the public, but their union members. And this is where the public interest and private interest can come into conflict. Public officials are often powerless to confront these public service unions. In the case of my little town here in Texas, Leander, Texas, our uncovered pension liability is about 16.7%. And our pension liability as a percent of covered payroll is 35.37%. These are actually pretty good numbers compared to some. The case of Austin, a nearby liberal bastion, is similar. They have an unfunded pension liability of about 20% and a liability as a percent of covered payroll of 86%. So that's a little bit higher than Leander. But citizens need to be aware of these situations. So our Texas cities are fairly well covered, but that's not always the case. In the example of Chicago, their pension liabilities as a percent of covered payroll range from 200% to over 700%. The city of Chicago is essentially bankrupted by its pensions. It's up to citizens to make sure that their city is properly managed and that the government has not been captured by the Public Employees Union. Thank you. Thanks for listening to my podcast. If you would like to hear more Edifice of Trust podcasts, please don't forget to subscribe. Thank you.